Ask Australians who was the most famous Anzac in the First World War, and most would probably answer Simpson, the man with the donkey. And they'd be right in a way. Simpson's a household name in Australia today. But if you were to ask the Anzacs who actually fought in the First World War, you'd get quite a different answer. Prime Minister Billy Hughes was so popular with the troops in France, he was nicknamed the Little Digger. General Birdie Birdwood was also universally known and popular, while Lieutenant General John Monash was held in very high regard. Quite a feat, since the Anzacs famously didn't think much of generals. Yet rivaling these famous men was an even more unlikely candidate for the most famous Anzac of the Great War, Captain William Mackenzie. Mackenzie was chaplain of the 4th Battalion, an enthusiastic Christian minister and keen on evangelism. He was against booze, brothels and bad language. But by the end of the war, he was so popular that it took him more than three hours to walk less than three blocks from his office in Goulburn Street to Sydney Town Hall. People mobbed him just to shake his hand. So who was this clergyman who won for himself the nickname Fighting Mac? William Mackenzie was born in Bigia, Scotland in 1869 and remained proud of his Scottish heritage all his life. Mackenzie's family migrated to Australia when he was 15, settling near Bundaberg, where the teenage Mackenzie soon rose to be an overseer on a cane farm. He grew to be a big man, nearly 190 centimetres tall, weighing in at over 100 kilos with fists the size of hands. He loved fighting and abandoned his strict Presbyterian upbringing. But at the age of 19, he had a dramatic turnaround. The Salvation Army came to town, and despite himself, Mackenzie was impressed with their work for the needy. One morning, he felt impressed to join them, and soon trained as an officer in the Salvos, and then served in tough, working-class towns such as Newcastle and Charters Towers. When the Great War began in 1914, Mackenzie volunteered as a chaplain. He was assigned to the 4th Battalion in the 1st Brigade. He got a frosty reception. What the hell have we done to deserve this? said one soldier. While others played practical jokes on him on board ship. He tried to start a sing-song and the soldiers cruelly counted him out. Daniel, what did Mackenzie do to change the attitude of the soldiers here at Mina Camp at the foot of the pyramids? Well, the first thing he did was hold such lively and very short church parades that his parade became the most popular one in the battalion. Out of the 4,000 men, he would attract up to 2,000 to his services. He would let the men sit instead of having to stand in the hot sun. And then he joined in all the training exercises. He'd go on the marches out in the desert He'd uh, dig trenches with them. 
anywhere the soldiers went, he went too. That's quite a commitment because it's sandy, it's dusty, it's hot. It would have been hard work being involved in, in those sort of marching and ac training activities, and yet he did it voluntarily. Yes, he didn't have to go. And remember, these were marches designed to knock the stuffing out of young soldiers. And Mackenzie's in his mid-40s, twice the age of many of them. But he kept up and kept the lead. He would carry the packs of tired young soldiers <laughs> just to give them a break. He prided himself on digging trenches faster than the men. Target practice he excelled at. Uh, anything they did, he did. He would organise lively, dynamic concerts and sing-alongs with the men. He uh, ran boxing tournaments. It's believed he even participated in them. Apparently he was a very good boxer. You can understand why they related to him and how he won their confidence. Yes, very much. He's a very dynamic personality, very engaging, fantastic sense of humour. Sounds like a, a, a chaplain that really related to the soldiers, knew what would appeal to them, almost in a sense became one of them. He did, he did. He really identified. He had such an inspirational and magnetic personality. Uh, people just loved to be with him and he loved to be with people. Yet the cheap drink and the brothels of Cairo attracted many of his men. And like the other chaplains, Mackenzie would hold religious services, pray with the soldiers, and counsel them against visiting the brothels here in the bazaar district of Cairo. Without criticism or condemnation, he did his best to keep them out of the baths, brothels, and gambling halls. But unlike other chaplains, Mackenzie also acted. He would come here at night, and literally drag men out, put them on the tram back to the camp. He fully expected a knife in the ribs from the brothel owners for ruining their business. On Good Friday, April 2, 1915, Australian troops rioted here, burning down the brothels and chopping up the hoses of the fire brigades, attempting to quench the blaze. Daniel, I understand that some people believe that Mackenzie organised and actually led the riot. Yes, there are some people who've said that, but it isn't true. In fact, Mackenzie knew nothing about the riot at all. Perhaps he might have accidentally inspired it because he did preach against it and once said, I wish the place could be blotted off the earth. And some soldiers thought they might give him his wish. But no, he did not organise, plan or even condone the riot. Daniel, I can imagine those young Anzacs being let loose in this Cairo bazaar and just having the time of their lives. Oh, look, they did. They explored everywhere they could. They haggled. They were fascinated. Uh, by turns, they were horrified at some of the things they saw. Uh, some of them went for the temptations that we're here. But Fighting Mac was fearless. He would dive into those places and drag the Anzacs out. In fact, after the war, he was credited with having saved thousands of soldiers from venereal disease. In fact, on the 2nd of April 1915, the day of the Good Friday riots at Wazir, Mackenzie and his unit received orders to pack and move to the port of Alexandria. From there, they boarded transport ships to the island of Lemnos, where they could see the hazy outline of the Turkish coast on the horizon. Everyone was on edge, knowing that their baptism of fire was imminent.
But Mackenzie was not part of that day's dramatic events. All Padres had been ordered to remain on board the hospital ship. Mackenzie heard the sounds of fighting and saw the consequences as he helped the badly wounded men. On the 25th of April, 1915, the Anzacs landed here on the Gallipoli Peninsula, at this cove that later took their name. A couple of weeks later, an impatient Mackenzie was allowed to join the fighting men. One of his first tasks was to bury his commanding officer while kneeling close to the ground to avoid becoming a casualty himself. It was here on Gallipoli that Mackenzie won the undying respect of the Anzacs. Like other chaplains, he conducted burial services on the front line, often under shell and sniper fire. After one funeral service, he found three bullet holes in his hat. Fighting Mac thrived on these risks. But Mackenzie stood out for the way in which he cared for his men. Once he tramped all over Anzac Cove, collecting enough chocolates to have one for each man. Another time, he spent all night cutting steps into a steep, slippery part of a track to make it easier for stretcher bearers. The stairs were christened Old Mac Steps by the soldiers. But his actions at Lone Pine are typical of why he's called Fighting Mac. This is what remains of the Australian trenches here at Lone Pine. Imagine the scene. It's mid-afternoon, August 6, 1915. Mackenzie's battalion is waiting to attack the Turkish positions behind me here. The Turkish trenches are deep and covered with logs and earth. Everyone knows that the attack will be costly. Mackenzie should have been at the rear trenches, but instead he's with his men right here on the front lines. His diary reads, Many tremble from head to boot, yet despite it all I felt strangely elated and somewhat excited over the prospects. A soldier recalled that before they went over the top, Mackenzie turned to the men and said, Boys, I've preached to you and I've prayed with you. And do you think that I'm afraid to die with you? I'd be ashamed to think of myself to funk it when you're up against it here. As the men charged, Mackenzie followed, carrying just a spade. He was to need it. Over the next few weeks, he sorted the living from the dead and buried 450 men. These are the Turkish trenches at Johnston's Jolly that were attacked by the 4th Battalion. Mackenzie was here with his men, tending to the wounded and burying the dead. The Turkish trenches are just metres away. Mackenzie would have come up this communication trench to conduct worship services with small groups of men at a time. For his actions here at Gallipoli, Mackenzie was decorated with the military cross. Daniel, there's no doubting Mackenzie's courage and bravery, 
But what sort of spiritual impact did he have on the soldiers? Oh, look, Mackenzie was a spiritual giant. In the course of the war, he brought something like two to 3,000 men to Christ through his own ministry. Uh, listen to what he wrote when he was in Egypt. I realise the nearness of his presence and something of the sweetness and power of his great salvation. I confess that I cried myself to sleep last night or in the early hours of the morning after long meditation over the sacrifices and death of Christ of God. This, I think, helped me read the scriptures and preach the truth better at this morning's parade, when for half an hour some 2,000 of us there sang of the cross and its meaning and pondered over the story once again. But what about here at Gallipoli under battle conditions? Well, obviously he couldn't hold the monster meetings that he'd done in Egypt, but he would move through the trenches and hold meetings with small groups of men as he went along. One evening he collected some men in the bowl of hills behind us, campfires dotted around the scene, the moon was shining bright over the Aegean Sea, and he held his service there. As we sang the familiar hymn, Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. The strains of the grand helpful prayer wafted down and around the valley and were taken up by men on all sides who were engaged on duty. The sentries, standing on guard at the mouths of the trenches nearby, with fixed bayonets, likewise joined in the refrain. And while we were singing, plenteous grace with thee is found, a platoon of armed warriors marched right past us, and taking up their position in the support trenches, they too marched on singing, let the healing stream abound, make and keep me pure within. After the Battle of Lone Pine, Mackenzie found the body of a young Scot whom he'd led to Christ the day before. In the man's pocket was a letter to his God-fearing mother, telling her of his decision for Christ. Knowing he was dealing with men who might die at any time, lend urgency to his work. He wrote, Last night while talking to the men, I was obsessed with the idea and yearned with unutterable longing to lead them to the blessed Saviour. One is very near to the eternal here. Indeed, all subterfuges are rudely torn aside, and one is ever treading on the threshold of the eternal world and marching in step with the sinister shadow of death. After Gallipoli, Mackenzie continued his good work in France. He was as energetic as ever, running canteens for the troops, meeting them with hot drinks when they came out of the line at night, and organising spur-of-the-moment sing-songs and entertainments in the billets. Despite orders to the contrary, he frequently went up to the front line to cheer up the men. He was finally evacuated in late 1917, suffering from exhaustion. His impact on the lives of thousands was recorded by a noted journalist. Chaplain Mackenzie performed deeds that made him appear almost as a superhuman. The men tell such strange stories of his heroism. I scarcely dare to relate the half of them. But these brave fellows love him with a strange, wonderful love. I've never seen anything like it before. And proud must be the man who has made such a conquest. They speak much of his nerve, but more of his real religion and his prayer meetings with them when death was near. Their fear for his safety was so great that again and again they placed their own bodies between him and the threatening shrapnel. Fighting Mac held a special place in the hearts of thousands of ordinary soldiers who had gratefully received help and comfort in their darkest hour. Some have said that the Anzacs were not terribly religious. Perhaps so. But Mackenzie noted on Gallipoli that many showed an interest in God. 
men realize as never before that the most manly thing to do is to worship and glorify God. Perhaps there's a message in Fighting Mac's words for each of us. Let's contemplate the wisdom of worshiping and glorifying God as we pray. Dear Father, what a mighty hero William McKenzie proved to be. For his life, example and inspiration, we thank you. And we pray that we might, like him, put our trust in you. We pray that we may demonstrate a faith that also shows courage. Amen. If you would like to read more about William McKenzie, then I would like to offer you this book, The Faith of the Anzacs. As well as McKenzie, other chaplains are featured, as are soldiers and officers on Gallipoli, whose faith shone in the harsh trenches. Just call or visit our website for your free copy of this inspiring book. It's been a privilege to retrace the steps of fighting Mac and the Anzacs. Until next week, remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God.